Hello, welcome to EE380, Stanford's uh, Computer Systems Laboratory uh, uh, Colloquium on uh, Computer Systems. Um, we have a speaker from the University of Vermont today, uh, Josh Bongard, who uh, is going to talk to us about uh, computer designed organisms. That is, uh, well, he'll find out about it, but uh, he's, he's in, the, in the business of making meat pots these days. In any case, it's, it should be an interesting talk, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, your comments. Uh, Josh, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, and uh, thanks to all of you for your interest in, uh, as Dennis mentioned, uh, meat bots, uh, otherwise known as computer-designed organisms. Um, so I'll just spend a minute uh, setting the stage before diving into uh, the subject itself. Um, I'm Josh Bongard. I'm a professor of computer science uh, here at the University of Vermont. And uh, the work I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration with my PhD student, Sam Kriegman, and our two biology colleagues, uh, Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin uh, at Tufts. Uh, Michael runs the Allen Discovery Center uh, at Tufts University. Um, and so as you can tell just by looking at the, the title slide here, um, this project is 50% computational and 50% biological. So I will, um, given the audience focus most of my uh, talk today on the computational aspect of CDOs. I will talk a little bit about the biology, but not too much, simply because uh, I will rapidly exhaust my uh, knowledge and expertise in that area. Um, if you are interested in the, in the biological details of CDOs, I refer you to uh, Doug and, and Mike. Um, Mike in particular might be an interesting uh, guest for your, your seminar series. Uh, Mike, uh, although he's a biologist, has a formal training in computer science and uh, therefore is a great interdisciplinary researcher as well and is doing some amazing work other than just computer designed organisms. So um, before, again, before we talk about these little guys themselves, um, I want to just sort of set the stage about where I think computer designed organisms uh, fit within the larger landscape of AI and robotics. And to describe this landscape, I'm going to use a geometric metaphor. Um, and to start with, I want you to imagine we have a one dimensional line segment like you see here. And we can then represent uh, agents or robots and the algorithms that train them as embeddings in this one dimensional space. So uh, if you imagine any point uh, embedded in, inside this line segment, that point could represent a trained agent, a robot, or as you'll see uh, shortly, a computer designed organism. It is better or worse at some particular task that we've posed uh, to the agent. And you can then think of your favorite uh, machine learning algorithm as a line segment embedded in this segment. And that algorithm uh, pushes points from the left side of its segment to the right side of its segment and is obviously trying to generate agents as far to the right as possible. And as we all know, uh, the, the deep learning revolution and the big data revolutions have uh, allowed us to make rapid advances in producing performant uh, machines. If we continue this uh, geometric metaphor and add a second dimension, which are, which are the tasks, plural, that we set before uh, our machines, we can still think of any individual agent or robot as a point in this now two-dimensional uh, space. The further to the right it is, the better at whatever it is we want it to do, and the higher in this space that point is, the better it is at a harder task like NLP compared to checkers, or potentially it's more general, it's able to perform well at a, a larger number of tasks. It doesn't really matter for our discussion today. This is just a bit of a metaphor, it's a little hand wavy. Um, but the reason I, I use this metaphor is um, like many roboticists, I'm interested, um, oh, sorry, let, before I get to the third dimension, we can sort of um, think about how far we can push this idea of creating uh, better and better machine learning algorithms and some people believe in AGI, some don't. Uh, I don't really know what artificial general intelligence means. Artificial general and intelligence, all three of those terms are exceedingly difficult to, uh, to define. But some people would argue we just need bigger neural networks and more data centers and more data, and that's it. That's all we really need, and we'll eventually uh, we'll continue to produce increasingly performant and increasingly general uh, agents. 
But um, like many other roboticists and others working uh, in AI in general, um, I'm also interested in a third dimension, which is sometimes known as uh, embodiment or morphology or body plan. Um, embodiment is a controversial term. It means different things to different people. I'm not going to uh, attempt to define embodiment today, but most, most people could look at the Atlas humanoid robot and the, the humble Roomba here, and most would agree that the Atlas robot is more embodied or is embodied in a more complex manner than the Roomba. The Roomba is more embodied than a naked neural network running on a laptop waiting passively uh, for data. So we can then ask the question, or we can start to think about algorithms that push along the grand diagonal. So if you imagine a line segment embedded in the grand diagonal here, that line segment, however it does it, is incrementally producing more performant machines, those further to the right, slightly more uh, general machines. This algorithm is exposing the agents to a slowly growing set of tasks or variants of a task. And finally, this algorithm is pushing towards the back uh, of the cube here to, and incrementally complexifying or improving the mechanical structure uh, of the, the machine. So um, that's the algorithm that I'm gonna talk about today. The algorithm that produces uh, computer designed organisms has these three characteristics as we'll see uh, shortly. So just to take an example of how to sort of use this metaphor, here's some work by uh, a Stanford grad, um, uh, Karpathy, working with Google, um, did some amazing uh, work a few years back using the arm farm here. So seven robot arms trained over uh, four months, 580,000 grasp attempts were performed uh, to, and generated data to train a 1.2 million parameter neural network. And at the end of those four months, they exposed these arms to a set of uh, new objects and the arms performed well 96% of the time. Uh, an, incredible, uh, an, exper an incredible experiment, but if we then try and embed this in this space, what it gives us is a line that moves through a horizontal cut through the cube. These seven arms all have exactly the same embodiment and that embodiment does not did not change over the four month period uh, of, this, uh, of this experiment. So what happens if we relax that assumption? What happens if we assume now that the body uh, or the bodies of each arm in the arm farm here changes significantly? Obviously there's some in, insignificant wear and tear and so on, but can we, uh, exploit the fact that the embodiment of these uh, robots is changing to improve uh, their ability to learn a set of tasks. So as just an example of this, uh, several years ago now, I worked on a project with Hod Lipson at, at Cornell University, where we assumed that the change in embodiment was unintentional. And in this unintentional change, the robot suffered unexpected uh, damage, its morphology changed, and the control policy that had previously been trained on the intact robot uh, no longer worked on the, uh, on the damaged robot. We then did some model-based control where we assumed that the sensor motor data being returned by the physical machine was used to train or adapt uh, the model to better reflect the robot's physical uh, state. And then once it had uh, adapted that uh, model, it could retrain a control policy and deploy it back to the damaged machine and allow it to recover functionality. I'm not going to talk about that work today, but just to give you a flavor for the kinds of things we can explore when we assume that the body of the agents are changing over time. Okay, so uh, another way to think about this, if you're more comfortable with reinforcement learning, is to take the standard uh, five tuple where we assume the agent is capable of a set S of states. It's capable of a set A uh, of actions. Uh, and we are trying to uh, evolve or we're trying to train uh, a policy to change state into action. We have some reward function that will determine the quality of any given uh, policy. And we have some subset F, uh, uh, sub F, which is a subset of some desired or final state. And finally, we have the, the transition function, which will take uh, the action at time t and translate it into the new state S, t, S sub t plus one that the agent experiences at the next time step. 
I've introduced a slight modification to this formalism here, which is to parameterize uh, the, the uh, transition matrix with M sub I, where M is some description of the morphology or the embodiment uh, of this uh, agent. And we can then, add, and in a standard reinforcement learning experiment, of course, it's the policy that is the target of optimization. But what happens if the morphology itself is changing, or better yet, the morphology also, or M, also becomes a target of optimization? Uh, obviously, if we have an algorithm that is changing uh, morphology from I to J in this case, it is also having impacts on S and A. For example, if we add or remove body parts from a machine, we may increase or decrease the dimensionality of the state and action spaces. We can ask questions like if we make an arbitrarily small morphological modification, under what conditions can we uh, guarantee that there will be a correspondingly small change in the state space, the new state space and action space for this new machine. We can then generalize that and think about what the biologists refer to as morphospace, which is the space of all possible uh, morphologies. And we can then think about moving through the space and looking for gradients. Can we, for example, move from one morphology to another in morphospace and climb a gradient towards some desired uh, meta state? For example, searching for morphologies that increasingly facilitate an inner loop of policy training, for example. Those are the kinds of things we work on uh, in my group, and we've looked at that with uh, simulated and physical, uh, rigid and soft robots. But today we're going to talk about neither of those and focus instead on uh, meat bots. Um, of course, uh, my group is not the first to think about this. Um, most of you will probably be familiar with the groundbreaking work of Carl Sims all the way back in the early 1990s. Uh, Carl Sims was a computer graphics researcher, among other things, created his own physics engine six years before there were any commercially available physics engines, and then created at that time an evolutionary algorithm that could simultaneously alter uh, the body plans and control policies of virtual creatures. It was a groundbreaking uh, report at the time and is still in many ways considered state of the art. It's very difficult to improve upon Carl Sims's work. Um, one of the reasons for that is that when we are searching through morphology space, it is very difficult to guarantee um, that we have a differentiable uh, system. And so uh, I'm going to hopefully try and convince some of you that this is an interesting problem to work on. There is an open subproblem in this problem, which is can we create differentiable algorithms that are able to move continuously through morphospace, looking for morphologies that admit or facilitate the inner loop of policy training? Okay. So um, let's switch now and talk about uh, applying this idea to. Uh, robots that are made out of biological cells. Um, this was work that we reported just this past January uh, in PNAS. Um, I'm going to talk about the algorithm itself and um, uh, show you some images and videos of the uh, CDOs in action. All of the images and videos I'm going to show you today are available on a website we created for this project uh, in the lower left there. Um, there's also a pointer there to the GitHub repo, so you can dig into the code if you're interested. Um, there's a link to the paper itself and, and other materials. So as, as promised, as I just mentioned, we're going to look at a nested algorithm in which there is an outer and inner loop uh, of training. And I'm going to start with this outer loop of training. And in this outer loop, what we're going to do is continuously design virtual creatures, not that differently from how Carl Sims did back in the 90s. For each uh, promising design, we are then going to de deploy it into a physical environment and see how well the physically um, how well the physical agent does compared to the simulated agent. This is very closely related to uh, sim to real their sim to real problem uh, in robotics. If you think it's difficult to successfully transfer a relatively traditional robot from simulation to reality or just a control policy from sim to real. It's particularly challenging when we're trying to cross uh, what, what my PhD student Sam calls not sim to real but sim to life. Okay, so I uh, just want to talk about this algorithm a little bit. Um, we're going to assume that the investigator supplies a series uh, of tasks. 
Um, you can think of these as reward functions if you like. We are also going to supply beta, which is a description of the physical building blocks from which the agent can be built. Um, in some related work in soft robotics, we build soft robots out of soft voxels that can increase and decrease their local volumes. Um, in this case, uh, as promised, the building blocks are going to be cells that are drawn from uh, Xenopus slavus, the African uh, clawed frog. We are also going to require a couple of other parameters. I'll just refer to these as theta. I'm not going to go into the too many details of these, but you can think of these as constraints that we are going to draw back or we are going to distill out of the organisms, out of the computer designed organisms. And those constraints are going to be information that allow us to uh, improve our simulation and improve our ability to uh, our, our, or increase the likelihood of a successful sim to real transfer during the next iteration through this uh, outer loop. So this is an idea uh, that's again uh, very popular in sim to real at the moment, which is to collect sensor motor experiences from the physically deployed plant and use that sensor motor data to automatically reverse engineer or improve uh, the simulation or the transition matrix that we're using to uh, train our virtual, the vir our virtual agents. Okay, so then we're going to go through this infinite loop where we're going to start by uh, training an agent to perform some task and that agent can be built out of some arbitrary number of the building blocks in beta and we're going to train them in some simulation that's been parameterized or constrained by theta. So let me uh, unpack this training algorithm a little bit. This is actually the, the middle loop. There are actually three nested loops of optimization here. I'm only going to talk about the outer and middle loops today. We're going to start by generating a population uh, of bodies. So um, we're going to be using a population-based stochastic gradient descent method, uh, otherwise known as an evolutionary algorithm. I'll talk about the evolutionary algorithm in a moment. But before I do, let me talk about the way that we encode uh, bodies in the system. Um, we're going to describe each body or we're going to encode it as a computational pattern producing network or CPPN. This is a data structure uh, developed by Stanley and it's loosely based on biological development and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, a CPPN, as the name promises, is a network, um, and here is a cartoon CPPN here. It has two input neurons and one output neuron. What a CPPN does is travel over uh, an, uh, a space of arbitrary dimension and paint a pattern into that space, not unlike a developing organism that is developing uh, in, a, uh, in an egg sac or is developing uh, in a womb and there are chemical gradients that are induced into that space and we start to lay down increasingly complex patterns across space um, in a developing embryo. In this cartoon example here uh, we have just two coordinates x and y so we're going to paint a regular pattern in space. Uh, what we do is to take this particular CPPN, visit the first position in the space, x equals zero, y equals zero, propagate those two input values to the output uh, neuron here, G. You can see that only X is connected to G. So, the, um, so at this point, X equals zero. It doesn't matter what the synaptic weight is. We're going to get a G of zero and place no gray at position X equals Y equals zero. We then move to the next point in the space. We supply that uh, set of coordinates to the input layer of the network. The value arriving at G dictates how much gray to paint onto that pixel. And we continue that process for some regular lattice in the space. And this simple cartoon CPPN gives us a horizontal uh, gradient. If we then randomly perturb or mutate this uh, network in some way, um, where we now have a, a single synaptic connection going from Y to G, you can convince yourself that, that this CPPN will produce a regular vertical gradient. We can also perturb the activation functions in the neurons, in this case replacing sigmoid with a step function, and this gives us a discrete uh, gradient in this case. And if we allow an increasing number uh, of hidden uh, layers with arbitrary synaptic weights connecting them and arbitrary uh, activation functions, we start to get more and more complex patterns like you see uh, in F. 
So what is a what is a CPPM doing? As you might be able to see by now, depending on the architecture and the weights of the network, it arbitrarily composes coordinate transforms inside a space and then paints or deposits some material based on those composed transforms. You can, uh, it's obviously independent of dimension. We can paint regular patterns in three-dimensional space. We could add T as an input neuron and paint regular patterns over time. Um, this is a relatively common type of generative networks if instead of trying to train a recognizer, we instead want to generate interesting or useful patterns, which in our case are going to be uh, robots that are made out, up of in in simulation voxels, but in reality, frog cells. So we're now gonna take CPPNs and following the work of Chini uh, et al back in 2014, we're gonna take a CPPN and ask it to determine which voxels exist inside an empty three-dimensional space. And for each voxel that's deposited, the CPPN is also gonna paint one of four colors onto that uh, voxel. Only three of the four colors are shown here. So we have uh, X, Y, and Z. We're going we're gonna to visit uh, 3D coordinates in the space. And we have two output neurons. The first out, output neuron presence, we're going to uh, scale this to a binary value. Zero means no voxel is placed at that position. One indicates yes, a voxel is placed at that position. If a voxel is deposited at that position, we scale the, the value of the second output neuron to an integer from one to four, and that integer indicates which color to paint onto that voxel. So we've now created uh, an arbitrary three-dimensional shape, and you can, again, play around with creating different CPPNs and imagine how they produce different shapes and different distributions of colors onto those voxels. We're gonna use those colors as pointers into uh, material properties. What do I mean by material properties? Once we have this 3D structure, we embed it in, or we send it to a finite element soft body uh, simulator. Um, in our case, we use uh, VoxCAD. This was originally developed by uh, Hod Lipson at Cornell. We've uh, recently adapted this to run on uh, GPUs so we can simulate very high resolution soft body uh, mechanics. Um, what you can see here are these three different materials at play. Um, the red and green voxels are meant to be actuated voxels. So we assume there's a local actuator in each red and green voxel that can increase or decrease the volume of that voxel. All red voxels uh, oscillate in phase with one another. So we also assume there is a, a local, uh, a distributed open loop controller. All the green voxels oscillate in phase with one another and red and green voxels oscillate in antiphase with one another. So loosely based on the idea of agonist and antagonistic muscle groups. The light blue voxels that you see are passive, uh, passive soft material like fat, uh, like fa uh, fatty tissue. And we can then, um, uh, and I'll show you how we then evolve these CPPNs in a moment. Um, but before I do, as I mentioned, what we're doing is creating an initial population of bodies on line one here. We're then gonna run an evolutionary algorithm that is going to evolve different body plans and different material distributions over a number of generations. For each body in the population at each generation, we can call an inner loop of training that will train a particular policy for that body. In the uh, CDOs you're gonna see today, there is no policy. So like, uh, like the robot we just described here, there is no separate neural control policy um, it is sort of implicit in the structuring of the body. Depending on where we place these red and green voxels, we get different uh, behavior. So we're going to assume that the policy itself or the starting policy is dictated by theta, the thetas, which you'll remember are things that we're learning from the physically deployed agent. In our case, it's, it's going to be these computer designed organisms. 
assuming we do we do have the possibility of training a policy for this specific, specific body we can run a relatively standard reinforcement learning uh, method in here where we have the unrolled loop uh, in line five here we update state we update reward and we might return the total reward obtained by the policy for this body so we're uh, assuming we run this what what algorithm 1.2 gives us back is the total reward for a given body if we cannot change the policy or there is no policy then we simply run the body in simulation or in reality and somehow measure uh, in, or uh, integrate reward over that simulation and return that value so after line four here we assume that we have evaluated every body and we have a reward associated with that body We then, uh, we then, as I mentioned, we're going to run this forward over a number of generations. So this is a screenshot. Uh, this is a video, again, not from, not from our CDO project, but from Cheney's work in 2014. It shows a nice sort of visualization of how this evolutionary algorithm manipulates populations of CPPNs. What you're seeing in the top half of the video is the best, uh, the, the, the body that obtains the highest reward or what we would say in an evolutionary algorithm, the greatest fitness. You'll notice that evolution is exploring the morpho space um, of these voxel-based robots. You'll notice that it is uh, sampling body plans that have different three-dimensional shape and also different distributions of the red and green muscle groups. And in a few of them, you'll see small amounts of light blue, which is fat, dark blue, uh, uh, bone, uh, the analog of bone. Not surprisingly, at least in retrospect, what does evolution do? It converges on basically balls of muscle because the reward function here is simply di uh, distance over time. There's no penalty for uh, energy usage. Okay, um, in the work I'm gonna show you in a moment, um, for CDOs, we used a, a more modern uh, evolutionary algorithm, the age fitness predo optimization method. This is a multi-objective optimization method. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but one of the nice things about AFPO is that it maintains genetically independent species inside the same population. So what you're looking at in this figure here, this is a, a typical result from running AFPO. We have number of generations or a computational effort, if you like, on the horizontal axis. And the vertical axis is reward or fitness, which in this case is uh, body lengths traveled. Each colored line shows the, the most from that species. So we can see there are many species at any given time. You can see the pink dinosaurs here sort of plateau in fitness after a while and the light blue mammals here which are for quite a while are much worse than the dinosaurs after many generations of mutation and genetic recombination eventually field uh, a light blue robot that travels faster than the best uh, magenta dinosaur robot. Um, what, what AFPO does, as you could probably guess, is it probabilistically samples from different uh, subpopulations or species which have discovered local optima, and those that are uh, higher in the space, better local optima, uh, are, are preferentially sampled from. Okay. Okay, so again, back to uh, computer-designed organisms. So when we run this, we're using the VoxCAD voxel-based uh, simulator. And when we run this and we select for forward uh, displacement, when we're working with CDOs, our set beta contains only two Lego bricks. There are only two types of voxels that the algorithm can use. Red voxels, which like in Cheney's work, are going to pulse at a regular frequency. They're gonna increase and decrease their volume at a set, uh, uh, at a set frequency, and also green voxels, none of which you see in this evolved body plan here. The green voxels are meant to be passive, soft material. When we actually run this, uh, we actually visit line three 100 times. So we run 100 independent evolutionary algorithms, and each evolutionary algorithm gives us back the body plan with the highest reward or fitness from that 
uh, evolutionary algorithm. And you can see what the biologists refer to as convergent evolution here. Although there are robots that have different shapes, they are all basically balls uh, of muscle. You'll notice also that they are all bilaterally symmetric, which is a good thing to have if you're interested in forward locomotion. Um, and remember that each one of these body plans has an underlying CPPN that generates it. As I mentioned earlier, when we talked about CPPNs, one of the nice things about CPPNs is they tend to paint regular patterns in space. If we randomly wire up a CPPN, it gives us a non-random pattern in the painted space. We do not get white noise. So part of the reason why CPPNs are referred to as abstractions of development is they compose coordinate transforms, which biases search. If you're searching over the space of all CPPNs, it biases search towards things that have symmetries, uh, symmetries embedded in symmetries, gradients, uh, repeated patterns, and so on. Okay. So now that we have our 100 trained agents, we would like to deploy them. And uh, this is where things get interesting. Um, in this case, as I mentioned, we're gonna deploy, we're gonna build these robots out of frog, uh, out of frog cells. So we sent those 100 designs uh, to Doug Blackiston, who's a very accomplished microsurgeon uh, at Tufts. And I'm going to walk you through how he goes about attempting to build uh, one of these designs. Uh, step one is to take uh, fertilized embryos from Zetopus lavis uh, and inject um, a marker and some other proteins that influence the stem cells inside these embryos to grow towards either uh, ectoderm, so skin cells, or pre uh, cardiac precursor cells, so uh, cells that are somewhere between stem cells and heart muscle cells. Um, after a couple days, he then removes the Vitaline membrane. So this is sort of the egg sac around uh, the embryo. You'll see him here with micro forceps removing, uh, removing this gelatinous covering from one of these uh, impregnated fertilized frog embryos. He's then going to remove uh, the cap from each of these embryos. Each cap contains several thousand or, or tens of thousands uh, of these um, of cells. Some of these cells are uh, epithelial cells, ectoderms, skin cells. Some are going to be cardiac cells. Let me see if I can speed this up for you. Uh, again, all these videos are available on the website. Uh, as you can imagine, this is very pain, uh, painstaking work. After removing uh, some of these caps, they're placed uh, in a solution which causes the cells to dissociate. So you can see uh, the white cells here. And again, if I speed this up, uh, you'll see um, uh, Doug removing some of the cap or the, the unwanted material. So basically what we're trying to do is dissociate these cells. And uh, Doug is then gonna manipulate them to reforming into the desired uh, shape and material distributions. And okay. So after we have these dissociated cells, um, they're going to, uh, Doug is going to inject them into a very small uh, well where just because of the concavity of the well, they start to uh, naturally collect together. And uh, if they're left for a while, Okay, so we were injected into the wells. I think this is, a, you can see the individual cells themselves. Um, and th these are going to be basically the Xenobot uh, once it forms into the right uh, shape. It can be anywhere from a few thousand to a few tens of thousands uh, of cells. And dissociated uh, frog cells uh, uh, will tend to try and uh, associate together. So they're left in these wells for a few days where they gradually re-aggregate. Um, as they do during this process, um, we can layer different cell types together. So depending on the distribution of uh, heart muscle cells and ectoderm cells, uh, Doug can basically lay down a, a meat sandwich. So layers of, ecto, uh, layers of, uh, of skin cells and heart muscle cells. 
You can see in this video a little bit better how over uh, two days they are re-aggregating re and basically form back into a ball of cells with at least generally speaking skin and heart muscle cells where we want them. And then in the very last steps here, uh, Doug takes one of these target designs, um, for example, a quadrupedal shape like you see here, and then using, uh, using a cauterization tool, and again, the micro forceps, he's able to very carefully shape this into the desired shape. So you can see him selectively cauterizing or removing some, material, some of the cellular material. As you can tell from this process um, in the CDO project at the moment, um, design has been automated um, using an evolutionary algorithm, but the manufacture process is still very much a manual process. Okay. This is towards the end now where he's starting to, to sculpt this into its final shape. Um, in this particular case, as you can see in the target shape on the left, um, this particular organism is, or this, this particular construct is only made from skin cells. This is actually how this project uh, got started. Um, uh, the Tufts group and mine are, are co-funded through a DARPA project. And on our weekly call, we were showing uh, our Tufts colleagues some of our evolved virtual creatures. Next week, Doug came back and demonstrated uh, that he had made a sculpture of one of these, uh, one of our virtual creatures out of frog. Uh, skin cells. Uh, it's just a sculpture at this point. It doesn't move, but that suggested to us perhaps we could get these things to move by adding in eventually uh, cardiac uh, cells. Uh, I don't think I mentioned yet, but these uh, current xenobots are very small. Um, they're less than a millimeter uh, in diameter, about 750 microns across. Okay, so that's the deployment stage. Um, in this particular paper, however, it turns out that the vast number of evolved designs were non-manufacturable. And so we basically worked out a protocol, or Doug worked out a protocol, um, which you can see as a flowchart on the right, which determines whether or not we're able to, uh, whether or not we're able to actually build uh, one of, a particular design. So um, in panel A, we ranked all of our 100 designs by, uh, by fitness or reward, how well they were. In the case of the best design, um, it did not have contiguous muscle cell uh, regions. So there were um, separate groups of muscle. At the moment in this manual construction process, there was no way to build this. So that design failed due to condition B1. It also failed due to B3, which is that it was not mostly passive tissue. As I showed you before, uh, most of these creatures are 100% 100 percent uh, muscle cells which is particularly difficult to do um, and i'll talk a little bit about that in a moment they some of them did not have a stable geometry some of them had overly complex shapes that uh, doug couldn't build as i mentioned the cells generally like to try and re-aggregate so if there is a concavity anywhere on the surface of the of the shape if it's too small um, the xenobot as it's growing will basically just fill fill this in so in this case, none of the 100 designs were real, real, realizable um, in reality. So we use that information um, to, again, modify the constraints of the simulation. Um, what we did in this case was to build in a particular constraint um, that, that became apparent due to all these failed designs. And that is that, and th this constraint is as follows. Um, if you arbitrarily place cardiac tissue in these xenobots, um, obviously those cardiac tissues are put together in a shape that is very different from a developing frog heart. And it is hard to predict how those cardiac cells will behave. So we built in a constraint that first of all, these cardiac cells are weaker. So it doesn't make sense to build, build a big ball of muscle. We also assumed back in simulation that since we have no understanding of how cardiac cells will or will not spontaneously synchronize when put together in arbitrary configurations, we assumed instead that in simulation, 
any, any cardiac cells will beat at random. So what you're seeing in these three videos are three random CPPNs producing three random softbots. And the way, that we, the way that we simulate this is we assume that all the cardiac cells have exactly the same frequency and amplitude, but they all have differing phase offsets. So they're all beating uh, at random. What that means in general is that what the evolutionary algorithm is now going to have to do is try and design the shape of one of these things to effectively de-randomize the collection at the collective action of the cardiac cells and channel all of those independently randomly acting uh, forces into forward locomotion. So uh, as a metaphor, uh, imagine you had a whole bunch of human rowers but they were all going to row uh, at the same frequency, but at different phase offsets. And your task is to build the shape of a boat so that when you put these human rowers in the boat, the boat will go straight. Um, I have not been able to figure out how to do this manually. It's a very non-intuitive design task, which is exactly what evolutionary algorithms are well suited for. So um, the first time through this outermost loop, as I showed you, we got these 100 evolved balls of muscle. We failed to, to cross the sim to life gap, but we learned something in that failed transferal, which we used to improve the biological veracity of the, the simulation. And when we iterated this loop again and built in these constraints uh, using theta, we got back these 100 uh, these 100 designs. As you can see in this second pass through uh, the outer loop, there are combinations of passive tissue, uh, I'm sorry, which is the cyan, the cyan voxel. So these correspond to frog uh, epithelial tissue. And red is the cardiac tissue. You also see lots, lots of different shapes. Um, you'll notice there are a couple of empty cages here, which are kind of interesting. Um, these evolved because we put in a little bit of hydrodynamics. So the xenobots operate inside um, a petri dish uh, with uh, with water, and so we put that put that in the simulation as well. Turns out that this empty cage was exacted in a later experiment by us to carry a small payload. Let me show you the best, uh, the best of all of these designs, which is in here somewhere. Um, here it is, and you'll see it in this video operating in silico. And Doug actually did manage to successfully build um, this design. It more or less has the same shape as the simulated Xenobot and has cardiac tissue mostly on the ventral or bottom surface of the Xenobot and mostly uh, passive uh, uh, skin cells uh, on the top. Okay, so this is just anecdotal evidence that we could cross the sim uh, to life gap. So let me talk a little bit more about this gap. Uh, the first thing we looked at in the paper was to uh, talk about um, uh, the, uh, the ability to transfer shape. So here the actual, here's the actual built Xenobot down here. Um, we, used, uh, we used some computer graphics methods to compare the shape and the distribution of materials in silico to um, in reality, in vivo. And it turns out that on average, the air was about 40% of the diameter of the agent. So not very good, um, but not bad, definitely better uh, than chance. And surprisingly, that although the shapes were quite a bit different, we were able to preserve behavior from simulation into reality. So although um, transferal of form was very noisy, transferal of function worked pretty well. Here's some quantitative data. So what you're seeing in the bottom plot is uh, five different instances. So, so um, Doug built five Xenobots based on this design and ran each of those five Xenobots three or four time, times in a Petri dish and recorded the trajectory on the bottom of the Petri dish, which are the blue trajectories. There should be about 20 or 24 of them. The pink trajectories are our predictions from simulation about how this design would move. Remember that I told you that the individual red voxels are uh, beating in random phase offsets with each other. So if we replay back this design and simulation multiple times, we get the pink curves. Um, 
as you can see, generally speaking, there's a preferential movement in towards uh, greater uh, X, which is the direction we evolved the xenobots to move in. To determine that it was actually the shape that was leading to displacement, we took each of these five uh, xenobot designs and flipped them on the, their back. We did the same thing in simulation, and in both cases that disrupted the ability to locomote, which tells us not only can we cross uh, the sim to life gap here, but that transfer the predict the behavior predicted from the simulated design, that behavior is a function of the shape and distribution of tissue throughout the body. Okay, so again, not a perfect transferal, but, but good enough to get the behavior we were interested in. We then um, did some other experiments other than just locomotion. Um, it turns out that if you take these uh, xenobots evolved for locomotion and put multiple instances of them in a simulator, you get this kind of behavior that you see in the top. Um, and you get more or less the same behavior uh, uh, in the bottom. Um, the xenobots themselves are slightly, uh, slightly adhesive and they also have com you know, complex three-dimensional structure. So if they uh, come in contact with one another uh, and apply oblique forces against one another. They do a little bit of the square dance and then move off and, and possibly connect with another partner. We also noticed um, in a third experiment, uh, sorry, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, we, uh, Doug tried out a bunch of these xenobots in a Petri dish. This is us looking down into the Petri dish. Uh, Doug sprinkled the bottom of the Petri dish with very small uh, particulate matter. And you can see that, uh, you can see the traces or the trajectories of these uh, xenobots. And they also uh, lead to piles of particulate matter. It is not clear whether that happens just through this, the statistical mechanics of these uh, randomly moving xenobots, or if they are somehow spontaneously sensing and acting on their environment. So xenobots are very much like the inverse of traditional robots. If you've ever worked with robots, they tend to do less or worse of what you expect them to do. And you need to put a huge amount of effort into embedding desirable functions into them. Um, xenobots, although they're designed uh, in computer, they also come equipped with four and a half billion years of experience with grappling with the real world, and they will spontaneously exhibit um, behaviors of their own, even behaviors that were not selected for in the evolutionary algorithm. We're working on a follow-up paper now to understand whether this uh, spontaneous uh, creation of piles is actually non-random. If, if perhaps these frog cells or the cells that make up these xenobots, although they don't have any sense organs or, or muscle groups per se, um, cells do talk to one another, even when they're put together in arbitrary configurations. And they, the cells in any one xenobot may be spontaneously coordin coordinating their action to give rise to interesting behavior like collecting piles. You can see this at the micro scale here, um, where Sam evolved in simulation a robot to push an obstacle. And uh, this was inspired actually by an observation in vivo. Here you see uh, a xenobot, which seems to be circling and um, like a little small sheepdog, shepherding this small piece of particulate matter forward. This was actually um, life to sim. So we were inspired by this behavior and wanted to see if we could evolve uh, robots to do it. So again, these xenobots seem to have some spontaneous uh, useful behaviors. One of the most important uh, behaviors that come for free from most of the xenobots we've created is that if you damage them, in this case, Doug is cutting one almost in half, you'll notice that after a few hours, it's able to gradually uh, heal itself. Um, I've worked with uh, robots for a while where, where we cut off one of the legs. It obviously never grows a leg back or spontaneously deforms to minimize or cancel out uh, the insult. So again, by, by building robots out of biological cells, we get a lot of spontaneous useful behavior for free. Okay, um, just to sort of close up now, I, I I'm getting close to uh, the end of my talk here. Um, just to sort of situate xenobots or computer-designed organisms in the larger landscape of synthetic uh, biology, 
Um, I've added one branch to synthetic biology here, which are all living constructs which have been designed by a computer or an AI or a machine learning uh, algorithm. What, what I've just introduced to you are computer designed organisms uh, from the ground up. There's no uh, assumption on our part about what the shape is or the patterning of the cardiac uh, tissue. Um, no assumptions about bilateral symmetry, how big these things should be, and so on. And the degrees of freedom that the evolutionary algorithm had at hand to design these are, is to reconfigure uh, the placement of tissue. So um, we referred to these in the paper as reconfigurable organisms. Um, the reason why we worked with Xenopus lavis is it's a very forgiving uh, model species. Um, Mike's group has demonstrated in the past that you can graft uh, an eye onto the back of a developing frog embryo and not only will that eye be functional um, in the adult frog, but that eye will spontaneously connect to the spinal cord and the adult frog will be able to direct behavior using the eye on its back. So the developmental trajectory of uh, frogs is a, a, um, incredibly permissive and that led Mike and Doug to think about um, how far away from the default developmental trajectory of frogs could we push things? And in this case, could we get a computer to design an alternate developmental trajectory with some perturbations from outside to produce novel uh, frogs that are not frogs, or at least frogs that end up with an adult shape very different from the default shape? Um, another branch of synthetic biology is um, human designed uh, uh, biohybrids, um, not so much human designed organisms yet. Um, this is uh, an older, uh, an idea that's been around for a while now uh, in the literature. Here's some early work uh, by Now Roth in, in 2012, um, basically embedding heart cells in a silicone uh, jellyfish. So we have a combination of artificial and biological materials, thus biohybrids. Um, more recently, uh, Park and his colleagues created a very small uh, um, biohybrid stingray. So in this case, they were able to culture uh, ra uh, rat uh, cardiac tissue on either wing of, uh, of the, the ray. And with some human ingenuity, they were able to optogenetically control the heart muscle cells on either side of the, of the stingray so that light falling on the front left of the stingray would trigger a cascading contraction from the anterior to the posterior side of that wing, uh, causing it to, to beat uh, faster or slower than the wing on the other side, receding, receiving less light stimulation, and therefore in the design produce manually designed machines capable of phototaxis or photophobia. So um, we're also working at the moment on other computer designed organisms that are constructed from other species other than Xenopus alevis. Um, those are not being built by reconfiguring cellular tissues together, but uh, altering their developmental trajectories in other ways. And uh, stay tuned, there'll be publications about this forthcoming. Um, one final note about the machine learning here. As I mentioned, we used an evolutionary algorithm. Uh, evolutionary algorithms are unsatisfying for a lot of people because you cannot guarantee uh, convergence. On the flip side, however, it is very difficult to see how to apply uh, a standard stochastic gradient descent method to designing body plans because, again, it is difficult to estimate gradients um, when we're adding and removing physical material. So uh, to test this, we uh, did a study where we took a very small xenobots. So these were xenobots that could only be built inside a two by two by two space, which leads to uh, slightly uh, six and a half thousand possible designs. Um, and within that space for randomly contracting cardiac uh, cells, it turns out that there are five optimal solutions that you see here. So we can enumerate all of the, all of the designs and know the morpho space perfectly. The morpho space is made up of these 6,500 possible designs. And given the control policy, which are these randomly contracting cardiac tissues, these are the five designs that travel faster than any of the other 6,557, 56 designs.
Um, so that gave us the ceiling of performance here. We ran our, our uh, AFPO algorithm, as I described to you, in green. And after uh, about 9,000 evaluations, it found one of these five optimal uh, designs. It took a little bit longer for uh, more standard SGD methods to do so. And the reason why is in this case, um, because we had to convert the policies into discrete values. So the policy now is a set of eight, uh, eight ternary, ternary values, which indicate w uh, whether or not to place a voxel there. So zero is place no voxel at that position, one is place a cardiac uh, cell at that position, two is place uh, is to place a skin cell at that position, and we need to then find uh, the gradient or estimate the gradient in this discrete policy space, which is particularly difficult to do and is, as far as we know, non-differentiable. If anybody has an idea about how to create a differentiable policy gradient descent, um, when the policy, policies uh, uh, parameters have discrete values, we would love to hear from you. We then reran this in a slightly larger morpho space that contains uh, over 500,000 possible designs. This, this we, we could still exhaustively uh, search and determine the best, the five best designs here, which have this performance. Uh, have, uh, and it, it turns out that in this case, the evolutionary algorithm found these optimal designs after about 4,000 uh, evaluations and simulation. The other two SGD methods that we looked at performed poorly, and they performed even worse compared to the evolutionary algorithm when we moved to a higher space, which again was just on the edge of us being able to enumerate all possible designs. So we knew what the optimal design was in each of these three spaces. We knew that with this computational effort, the evolutionary algorithm could consistently find it. The stochastic gradient descent methods could not. So still a lot of work to be done here about what is the right search method for simultaneously searching over designs and possibly also searching over an inner loop of policy optimization for any individual design. Um, these are some of the best designs produced by uh, the, the SGD method that we used here by Senka and, and Al. You can see that they look very different from the designs produced by the evolutionary algorithm, thanks again to the CPPN that produce these uh, designs. So um, an, an evolutionary algorithm armed with CPPNs is biased towards searching parts of the morpho space that contain uh, designs with symmetry and repetition uh, and so on. The other methods uh, do not. Okay, so I think just to uh, start to wrap up here, uh, I've introduced this idea, uh, I've introduced computer designed organisms where we use an evolutionary algorithm to discover novel forms, meaning um, adult phenotypes that do not exist in nature. And we're searching for novel forms that have desired function, which in this case was simply forward locomotion or object manipulation. Design was automatic, but manufacture was manual. You can read more, find out more about uh, CD, uh, CD orgs at that website. Future work um, that we're looking at is, can we gain control over spontaneously appearing useful functions? So the xenobots will spontaneously uh, stitch themselves back together after damage. They seem to spontaneously go after and collectively shepherd material in their, in their environment. But at the moment, we have no control over that. We have no understandable mapping from form to these spontaneous functions. We'd obviously like to uh, automate the manufacture of CD organisms. We're looking at bioprinters or um, bioelectric fields to influence the growth and movement of dissociated cells. Um, Doug is also hard at work in adding new tissue types beyond just skin and heart muscle cells. Um, we could also graft in or allow the evolutionary algorithm to arbitrarily place different sense organs in the xenobots, other kinds of actuators. So at the moment we just looked at muscle, but frogs also have cilia or very small hairs um, on their skin that they usually use to propagate um, muc a mucous membrane and wash, uh, wash off their skin. But we can also appropriate those cilia for, be uh, for beating and, and swimming 
uh, in, in a fluid. We could also uh, graft in uh, nervous tissue. And we could also potentially combine or build xenobots out of cells other than those from Xenopus, um, which we tongue in cheek refer to as chimera bots. And finally, also looking at automated improvement of the sim to life uh, transferal process. At the moment, we were very, we, we spent a lot of time observing failed transfers and inferring from that what to improve in the simulator. We'd like to uh, adapt some of the data driven sim to real methods from robotics uh, for this application. Uh, Mike, Mike Levin is uh, very interested in what he call what he call refers to as cracking the bioelectric code. So cells talk to one another using electricity, even if they are not uh, neurons. Could we design xenobots not to move quickly, but to advertise how their cells communicate in a given form to produce some desired function? At the moment, when we try and perturb or observe an existing organism, usually we kill it. But could we instead create uh, xenobots that are more amenable to simultaneously observation of form, bioelectric communication among the cells, and function? We're also interested in finding new collaborators. There's clearly lots of directions we could go with computer designed organisms. So if you're interested in this project, please do send me or my biology colleagues uh, a note. Finally, I'll close by obviously acknowledging the other three members uh, of this project and uh, DARPA for, for funding all of this work. So thanks very much, and I'll uh, finish up there.